We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. So welcome back to episode 146. Can you believe it? No, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to believe it. Yeah, well, it's true because I've worked out all my figures and my numbers, Bob. So what we're going to be talking about on this episode is the importance of observational skills in the therapy room, which oh, I well, think I'm... is a fascinating subject. And my beard has started to itch. But I mean, people aren't watching the... Uh, well, maybe they are. But if you're just listening, it's irrelevant, isn't it, really? observational skills within the therapeutic yeah the importance of that that's, yes. that's what i want to stress and when i thought of this title up one of the reasons i thought it up is because um it comes from the idea which has struck me over many decades <clears throat> is the importance in the training of counselors counselors and psychotherapists of observational skills and the diligence of that and what I think is that, especially in the counselling world, um, um, they teach observational skills at the beginning, but as the counselling training goes on, it often gets lost. Yeah. In the psychotherapy world, often it's similar. Now, you and I trained in transactional analysis, which I think is a big difference because the major pers- personality model of that particular modality transaction analysis is the parent <clears throat> adult child ego state model yeah and what we're trained in for not just the first year but throughout the training is how to how through the observation of behavioral observation sorry um um through observation that we can detect what ego state the person is actually coming from and front of us so we did a lot of work on spotting or practicing spotting or behavioral observation of gestures tone of voice uh many non-verbal signals so that we can work out or at least have a hunch hypothesis of what ego state that person is coming from so there's quite a bit of training in non-verbal signals and behavioral observation which I think is very useful when you're working with clients. Absolutely. I I, I <clears> found <throat> it completely fascinating when I was doing my training and I became really aware of my own behaviour as well, which was really interesting. That certain little things that I did that I was like, oh, I hadn't noticed that before. And did and did you go further than that and think, oh, um, that determines what ego state I'm in? Absolutely. I, I used to do a lot of this. I used to do a lot of you know, these sort of things, which I think are quite parental. Do you but know what I mean? People listening can't see you, so... Yeah, well, touching one finger with the other, or I would do, you know, yeah, but there's this, number one is this, and number two is that, and number three, and I would, ah. like... <clears throat> yeah, it was just really parental. Mm. I remember in training, when I was training people, observational skills or non-verbal signals, um, I get people to act out certain ways. So stand up and put your hands on your hips and, um, you know, indicate your finger at the next person. And then what you say might that come from when you watch that type of a uh, yeah. non-verbal process. It's then, really interesting because <clears throat> changing your <throat> posture changes your mindset as well. You, do you know what I mean? It does put you in a different place like you were saying then stand up and put your hands on your hips it does change the way that you think about things mm, it's absolutely. really powerful and and for psychotherapists and counselors it's a really important skill yeah. to bear in mind i think throughout the whole of their training and then to use when they start seeing clients because you know let's go back to well, I said TA trainees become TA therapists, but they start seeing clients in their second or third years on placements. Yeah. And we teach people to, you know, through three or four or five 
of the first sessions um, to evaluate through nonverbal expressions how long they might stay in one part of the self, I parent ego state, adult ego state, child ego state, and what that actually means. Yeah. <clears throat> Especially in terms of communication. I had a couple in, well, I, you know, you know, I do a lot of assessments. And I'm just thinking of a couple that came in for an assessment and then I sent them on to a couple's therapist. But this is in general what I'm talking about. But it reminded me this couple or so. That when couples in general pick people who fit into what I'm going to call interlocking scripts. Yes. In other words, uh, life plans which somehow lock in with the other person's life plan. And yeah. the other thing in a, in a relationship in transaction analysis terms um you get people who put a lot of energy in parental transactions which then hook people into child transactions yes so so one thing that i used to evaluate and think about was as i'm talking to this couple which of the two people spend more of their times coming from their parent ego state and which of the other, you know, which other person comes from their child ego state? And is that representative of how they talk to each other? Yeah. And I think what you were saying then about is that representative? I think that's a really valid point when we're in the early stages of therapy. Yeah. The, you know, it's highly likely that they're going to come into the therapy room in their child ego state on the first couple of sessions because it's new, it's different. They're going to be anxious. They don't know who we are. So they're not going to come in in their adult or I suppose they might come in in the parents. I'm not sure. I, th I think, you know, that in general, we can make a sort of overall sweeping sentence here that they might come in or at least spend a lot of their energy in their younger self or their yeah. child state when they come to therapy for all the reasons you've just said. Yeah. That doesn't take away that they might come in from their parent ego state or spend quite a lot of time in their parent ego state or at least the parent part of the child ego state. Yes. Yeah. For example, when they first come to therapy. And it's really important to think about that because it will then determine how you then address the person in therapy. Yeah. Cause so, what we're talking about here is like nonverbal communication. It's, it's gestures and tone of voice and, you know, all those sort of things that, yeah, they, they often go under the radar. It's not necessarily the words that they're using. It, it's it's everything else, the body language and everything that goes along with it. That's right. For, so, for example, as you know, Jackie, I was one of my I'm into reality TV programs, and one of my favourite um, reality TV programs is a program called The Traitors. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been watching that. Yeah, you probably watched up on Cast Up, and it's just been on. But if you if you watch that, one of the sort of important parts of that program is that when they banish who they think is a traitor or a faithful and they the 17 or however many of them around this big banishing table and they have to vote who they think is a traitor or who they think is a faithful now the way they start working these things out often is through the non-verbal behavior no. of the people they spend their time with so, yeah. for example, what you hear a phrase a lot, I used to anyway, and when I listened to it, is oh, their behaviour has changed. Since they were on the train coming to the castle, now their behaviour is completely different. Yeah. Or their voice has changed, or this has happened, or they started to express emotions and never used to be like that. Yeah. That, means, that must mean that XXXX. And there's a lot of evaluation of nonverbal behaviours for them to make their hunch decision who they're going to banish. And yeah. it's really interesting when you watch them sit around that table 
not only about why they're banishing people, but the nonverbal signals of the actual people around the banishing table. Absolutely. And yeah. most of these reality TV programs, if you watch them and watch the, their nonverbal behaviours, it is so interesting. Um, I do find it interesting. Just, just you know, people watching generally when I'm out and about and you, you're seeing people and you're watching them. And I can remember when I was doing my training, I'm not sure whether it was you that said it, but watching soap operas is quite yeah, good. Do you yeah, know what I, I mean? Just for <clears throat> learning the, the you know, non-verbal clues, turn the volume down and see what you can pick up from people. Uh, soap operas, they're only always in parent or child. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> and there's always a drama triangle going on somewhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, adult isn't adult isn't often there. No, no. Very important for clients. I mean, you know, the world of soap operas, the world of dramas, the world of tragedies, the worlds of traumas are the worlds that we move in with clients. Yeah. And their nonverbal signals determine where they're coming from when they're communicating, not only with you, but the stories they tell and the traumas they've uh processed in their histories and that's so important then in how we then tune with the person and how we then talk to the person yeah i can remember having a conversation it, during my training about this that we, we i can remember it distinctly there was one particular client that i i know i was in my parent ego state an awful lot with them because they were in their child ego state an awful lot and I was questioning that it's not right and and whoever it was I spoke to said that sometimes we need to do that in order to reparent them and teach them appropriately so we step into it and then appropriately step out of it at some point in the therapy which kind of made sense to me when it was explained mm. Yeah, you're completely right. And if we talk about TA again, and I apologize past people with other modalities or uh, counselors listening, but I just want to talk about a bit of theory called driver theory in TA. Yeah. And in TA, they, they have this piece of theory that talk about when people are under stress, uh, they move into what's called driver behavior, which then drives their like their behavior. And there's five of them clusters of them hurry up please me be perfect be strong whatever the other one was i can't try remember. hard try hard but each one of them will have a collection of nonverbal signals yeah that shows that they've moved into that place so let's take be strong so if you if you're observing somebody and thinking about nonverbal signals for somebody who's moved into a being strong place, there'll be a set of behaviors that go with that. And it's the same with all those drivers. And if you look out for that, then you can have some indication of what's what's driving their personality and what they're defending against. Yeah. Because underneath the driver behavior is, of course, the unmet needs. So the driver behavior becomes the coping mechanism with regards to the unmet needs. I think this is why I love transactional analysis so much is that everything's kind of interwoven with each other. That, do you know what I mean? The, the, the way that we hide our behavior or the things that drive our behavior when we're stressed or overwhelmed or, or anxious or anything is, is you know, it, it links in with the parent, the adult and the child that link then links in with the, you know, the script and it, it's just all interconnected. It's fascinating. Yeah. And in TA Today, written by Ian Stewart and Van George, which is a really good textbook around most of the TA concepts, they talk about driver, driver behavior, the five driver behaviors we just talked about there in terms of personality types. You know, please please others, please me, try hard, be perfect, etc. And I then talk about the behaviours, the non, the observable non-verbal behaviours that go with those particular drivers that yeah. we look out for to make our hunch diagnosis of where they're coming from and what they're defending against. So it's very useful, I think, as therapists to think about 
uh, the nonverbal signals, which will, can lead you to think what part of the personality are they then coming from and what are they defending against? And they're usually defending against mm-hmm. unmet needs. So being strong is a coping mechanism. Yeah. Being yeah. perfect is a coping mechanism. Trying hard is a coping mechanism. And they're all coping mechanisms, even though we call them drivers in TA, against the hurts of the younger self. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that I learned quite early on was telling somebody to not be strong doesn't really help. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> the worst thing that you can do because it's a, it's a survival mechanism. It's what's keeping them afloat, so to speak. So to say, don't do that. Is, is not going to help them. And they won't know what to do instead anyway. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like but you, the first part's really important, what you've just said, is if they go against that, but they won't know what to do, but if they did, of course, they'll probably drown. Yeah. I don't so, know if you can see behind me, I've literally got a picture of the drowning man up oh, there. Oh, yeah, on the drive. I, I literally talk about that all the time with my clients. It's my go-to. You know me in a diagram. Yeah, you love diagrams. But yeah. I think it's a very important driver, uh, sorry, uh, diagram there, because if if we do confront the coping mechanisms or the defend, you know, too soon, then... You know, it's like cutting through. It's like cutting the defense mechanisms too soon. The person then drowns in a way. Yeah, yeah. I think that's when they become overwhelmed, and sometimes they'll disappear from therapy and won't come back because. Mm. Yeah, mm. the other thing that I I think kind of links into observational skills is noticing changes in behavior in the therapy room as oh, well. Maybe yeah. you know red flags that what they're saying doesn't actually, it's not conducive with the body language that they're showing or, or things. Oh, absolutely. So the nonverbal signals or their behaviors is completely opposite. Yeah. What you're saying is a really important thing. And all, which will tell you such a lot. And the next important thing is when do you confront that? Yeah. One of my favorite questions that I, I, naughty I don't know whether it's been happening a lot with my clients lately is that I've been asking them the question what would I see if you were angry with me I can't remember the last time a client got angry with me and I'm not sure whether that's because I've not been doing a good enough job in challenging them or what so I've actually been asking them what would I see how would I know if if I upset you or if I made you angry in a a therapy session ask the question because depending on their personality type, will determine the answer. Absolutely. So some people, you might be afraid of conflict. Yeah. Might withdraw. Other people might go into some pleasing behaviour. Other people might show a shadow part of themselves or whatever. So it's a really good question. But it, it, it really opens up conversations around, you know, appropriate emotions and if anger is an okay emotion to have and, you know, how we deal with anger or aggression and things. So, yeah. Mm. The other thing I was thinking with nonverbal signals is um, in the world of intersubjectivity. That's a big word. <laughs> yeah, it's simply, <laughs> <laughs> it comes from the psychodynamic world. It, it simply means what happens between the two subjects. And so we say, the therapist is one subject, the client is the other subject, and there's an interspace between the two of them. So mm. it's more into subjectivity. Yeah. So as we get closer to the therapist or get closer to the client, what happens in the space between them is the theory around intersubjectivity. And often, I think, when the therapist and the, cl- the client are in that intersubjective space, the non-verbal signals often become more intense. Yeah. Uh, and so silence might happen more, for example. Yes, yeah. That happens non-verbally in the silence. You know, so I think for most people who, who like the world of intersubjectivity or may even read books on intersubjectivity, I think the evaluation of the non-verbal signals 
which happen in the space between the therapist and client outside verbal content is very important. Yeah. And and then, go on. on. I was just going to say t- that links in for me with transference and countertransference as well. Because when you said silence, then silence means a lot to me because of my past and my upbringing. It mm. usually meant that there was trouble brewing. I don't like silence. I'll try and fill <coughs> silence with something. So mm. if a client was quiet in that space, that would trigger a lot of thoughts in me, mm. which is interesting. Yeah, and the next question would be your question for a therapist. Oh, I wonder what you're thinking then. Yeah. The other world world is really important around non you know, verbal signals and behavioural observation is the connection between the body, feelings, thinking. In other words, how do the body and the mind go together? And if you think about it, verbal content or, you know, let's say the externalisation of the self through verbal content is really a manifestation of what's happening internally. Yes. Following me. So external, so verbal content through externalization is a manifestation of what's happening internally. In other words, what then could be played out through verbality or it might be played out through somatic processes. It doesn't always have to be played out through the verbal world. Yeah can be played out through the somatic area. In other words, headaches. Yes. Or tense stomachs, irritable bowel syndrome. We could go on, couldn't we? Yes, yeah, yeah, often, absolutely. Often, often, I would argue, that, that, that those somatic processes could, you know, actually be repressed emotions. Yeah. Which don't get expressed in the external world, perhaps through verbal content or through emotion. Yeah. And it's through the observable manifestations of how the person holds their body or the tenseness in their different parts of their body uh, or the agitation in their body might really indicate a way in for the therapist to ask the questions and, you know, mm-hmm. Just observe that you feel quite agitated. You, for example, yeah. your right leg has been jiggling. <laughs> energy as we speak. Yeah. What could be happening there if you found your own voice? Yeah. I think that's a really valid point. And I think a lot of us now have, have kind of lost the connection we have with our body and our mind. The kind of quite separated in a lot of us now that we don't see the connection with the the mental and the physical like you were saying about headaches or you know irritable bowel syndrome you know all those sort of things they're all interconnected absolutely absolutely that that that's really really important to use or to think about how the person's holding their body what could they be saying but they're not saying yeah actually saying in their behavior do you think there's a, there's a possibility that they're not even aware of it themselves oh nearly always not aware yeah so the fact that we broach that subject or it's a topic of conversation within the therapy room can be a real light bulb moment for some clients yeah i look i 100 percent agree and it's something i always did as a therapist but and i want to pass on a tip here and for people who might say, oh, I'll go and confront the person who's, I don't know, showing agitation or whatever it is. Yes, I think that is part of the duty of the therapist to help the person be aware of what's happening, perhaps at a body level, which actually doesn't come out in verbal content. But I also think you need to think about the possibility of shame. Absolutely. In yeah. this process as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's how you confront I mean, a really good podcast, which we've never done, is the use of confrontation mm. in psychotherapy. Because it's how you confront. It's how when you confront, which is the really big 
questions in psychotherapy. If you're going to say to somebody, you know what, I've been noticing that you're fairly agitated or, you know, I've been noticing that you, your fist is quite clenched when you talk about XXX, how come that is? You know, and the problem is, if you, you need to think about when you say it, you need to think about how you say it, because you'll never know unless you ask that the person might feel shamed, might feel interrogated, then they go underground and you'll never, therapy is going to be much harder. No, but the opposite side of that, if you do make that connection with them and the client feels seen and heard and noticed, that's a massive plus. Oh, so if it is handled correctly, it, it really does build the therapeutic relationship. Oh. If it's handled correctly, yeah, which I hope I did, you know, when I was making these confrontations, which I often did between the somatic defences and the, you know, the process I'm talking about, then you are helping somebody being aware of when they're in script. Yeah, and if you can help a person do that, that's what I call real therapy. Absolutely, yeah. So when it's done correctly. It's very important processes for psychotherapists to think about. Yeah. To help the person determine change, because unless they're aware of things, it's much harder for them to change, isn't it? So if they're Absolutely. not aware of yeah. in the first place, how could they ever change it? Yeah. Yeah. It's how you help the person do it, which is the crucial question. Yeah. What an amazing conversation this has been, Bob. I've loved it. Yeah, and I, 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 and I think anybody listening will know that if somebody confronts them in a, at a time when they're not perhaps expecting it, or time when they feel stressed, or that you know they they might move into shame so quickly and defend so quickly that it might take months for the therapist to actually reach them again. Mm. Yeah, I'm a real fan of helping the person being aware of what might be happening in their internal world and their body, yeah, because it, it will help the person be aware of what, what or how they might be sabotaging change. Yes, yeah. And it, it, like you said, Bobby, it, it all starts with awareness and... and... Yeah once we're aware of it then we have a choice we are, we can make a decision whether we want to continue doing it or not absolutely yeah i mean fitz pearls who was the originator of gestalt psychotherapy in the early 1950s he he was the gestalt psychotherapy in many ways is centered around the whole idea of cure is mainly through a person being aware and the interruptions to contact and the interruptions to awareness um, are is how they sabotage themselves actually changing. Yeah. The whole I, I love that phrase as well, the interruption to contact. I mm. think that's a, a, a lovely way of putting it. And that can happen like that in a therapy room. <laughs> yeah, and in many ways it has to happen. Yeah. That's the defense against you know the therapy that's actually working. How the therapist then deals with the process so the person doesn't feel shamed or belittled or put down or humiliated is a whole nother story. Yeah. And I'd like to think as the relationship builds between the client and the therapist, that the client feels able to actually verbalize and say what's actually going on for them and that they do feel shamed or something. Yeah. You know, one aspect. I've been a supervisor for a very long time and I teach people, in other words, I teach supervisees to, to think about behavioral observation in the world of helping their own clients. So in other words, I ask them to bring their client into supervision and describe and paint a picture of that client. And to paint that picture of that client in week one or two, and then in week seven and eight, and then in the last session. 
and tell me the difference in that painting. Yeah. And then it always, what's wonderful insight you will get from that. I'll let me paint a very quick picture of what I mean. So somebody comes in and said, oh, this is X. They come into the room, they sit down on the sofa, we have a glass of water, and then we start therapy. So then I say, okay, tell me what were they wearing when they came into the room? What was your impact? What was the first impact you had of them? When you went into the therapy room, where did they sit? Did they sit on the sofa? Did they sit on a chair? Did they sit on the floor? Did you offer them uh, water? Were they the people who asked for a cup of tea? Did they have a rain mac on? Tell me how they were sitting. So I'll get this whole picture. Now, right, let's move to the sixth session. Now tell me how they are. Where are they actually sitting now? How are they sitting? Oh, and as you get the picture, then they say, oh, they've taken off their coat now. They're sitting in a different part of the sofa. And you know what? They are much more relaxed. Yeah. Oh, now tell me about the ninth session, which was the last time you saw them. Where are they sitting now? Oh, they've got their feet up now. They don't have their raincoat on anymore. And all these things signify relaxation, yeah. safety, security. So a lot's happened. Yeah, absolutely. Behavioural observation from the first session to their last session, which can aid supervision and treatment direction. Yeah. Would so, you point that out? Would you mention that to them? About yeah, that's the important. idea of doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I was glad. I think that's an amazing opportunity within the therapy room. Well, I, I meant I, I meant I'm the supervisor. This is a supervisor that probably might be stuck or got some things they want to discuss about how to work with the clients. So, I they bring the client into the supervision room, and I use a supervisory, and I just the way I've done with you in many ways. How? What did you do then to help them be more relaxed? What happened between? XXX. So they get some ideas on how to develop their own skills as a therapist to aid security, safety, and relaxation. Yeah. Like a therapy room. That's a supervisory function. As a therapist, <clears throat> I think it yeah, I much uh, yes, I could teach them to say, I was really interested that you you seem to have changed in behavior. Do you see me in a different so there are ways a therapist? Yeah. Yeah, you, absolutely. Yeah, I was wanted to do this podcast to talk about the importance of therapist evaluation of behavioural processes and script signals as a signification of where a therapist might go in therapy and what might have changed. Yeah, yeah, because you, observational skills and and you know noticing nonverbal communication and all that sort of stuff is a really good way of giving and receiving feedback as well yeah in, in the therapy process do you know what i mean on how you're doing if somebody's kind of got their arms folded and the legs crossed and aren't really engaged it's a real big feedback that actually i'm not connecting with this client yeah and if you've got a good enough relation with the client you might say well, yeah you know i've just said this to you and i realize you've got your ha hands crossed or whatever you've just said how about you uncross you know your arms and cross your legs for a more perhaps open stance and see how you feel when i say the same thing to you yeah and see if there's a difference yeah because one is a much more defended way in a way another way is a much more vulnerable way and of course, you might feel you want to defend against your vulnerability. It's just for an experiment. Yeah. See, I like that. Just just as an experiment. Let's just well, give it a go and see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And usually I might do this around strokes and TA. In other words, the giving and taking of positive compliments, if you like. Yeah. But I say stroke is a positive unit of recognition. So if you say to somebody, oh, you did that really well. Now, how they receive that because they may have had a history of people never giving them strokes, so they might not believe you when you say it. If you ask them to experiment that from a more open position rather than a defended position, 
which you've reserved, um, you often see magnificent differences. Mm. So the client then becomes more aware of what part of the self they're operating from. What an amazing topic, Bob. It is interesting though, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I could talk about it for ages because it is something that really interests me. Mm. But unfortunately, we need to end. Yeah, yes, you might have better end. My behaviour will probably, uh, would it get more slumped of, of relief for ending? Or I'll be, you know, more vibrant with passion. And, or I feel disappointed and slumped because I didn't have the chance to even continue more talking about it. I don't know, but you are right. We have to end. We have to. Every, all good things come to an end, Bob, including <laughs> this episode. So yeah. what we'll be talking about next time is taking new routes in therapy. Oh, gosh. I look forward to that. Me too. Okay, until next time, Bob. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.